Welcome to this new episode of Norwich Theatre Talks. On the podcast today, I'm talking to two extraordinary women. As part of every episode of Norwich Theatre Talks, we meet a member of the wider Norwich Theatre team, and today, that's Teresa Baker, our Head of People and Culture. It takes a large number of people to make this organisation work, and the People and Culture team, which Teresa leads, supports our staff and volunteers across their whole life cycle with us. My first guest is a living legend, comedian, actor, writer and political activist. She's recently talked openly about her battle with ovarian cancer and is now here with us in Norwich on her Not Dead Yet tour. Please welcome to Norwich Theatre Talks the inspirational Janie Godley. Janie Godley, welcome back to Norwich and to Norwich Theatre Talks. Uh, with, I think, the last night of your current tour. Yeah, this is, well, technically it is, but they've added a day on, so I go home tomorrow, and then I have to head back out to Carlisle, um, straight after I get my bloods done at the cancer hospital, and then as soon as it's done, I go back, have a sleep, and get up and get my chemo. So <laughs> yes. it's I've managed to time the whole tour round treatment. That's that's incredible, and I was going to say, the tour is called the Not Dead yet yeah. tour so I cannot start without asking you how are you doing and how is the treatment? Well the treatment is keeping me alive so far my cancer number is high which means it's active in there somewhere they can't find it on the scan okay. so we've got to wait till it shows its self and then we go all oh, right that's where it is yeah. but as it stands I'm I'm fine the most pain I have is just I had a post-operative hernia and and that's like it's like a bunch of snakes has escaped to your stomach and peeking through Venetian blinds. It's weird. <laughs> that's a but brilliant. that's a bit sore. But other than that, I'm good. Yeah. And being on tour, that is is that part of is that part of your own therapy, your yeah. own getting through this, is being out there doing what you love. I think that being on tour keeps me alive in a sense because I'm not just a woman sitting at home waiting to die. No. I'm somebody who's got a valuable part of history and comedy and future and a legacy and all of that so you've got a function yes. as opposed to just sitting at home yes but incredibly empowering as well for other yeah. people who oh. who who I, I i i've seen don't quite know how to undertake the cancer yeah. journey that could be quite daunting it's Do terrifying it's like somebody's throwing a hand grenade into your family it completely changes everything about your life and that is quite a dramatic thing to deal with you have to now deal with that you've got a life limiting disease you don't know how long you've got left you can't make plans for holidays when you go to buy things you have to think twice like today i had to buy a, a rail card and i thought shall i buy a three year or a one year i don't know how long i'm going to live Course. And then when people invite you to weddings, you're like, I don't know if I'm going to be alive for her wedding. Yes. You know, um, and I'm bought a new car, and I don't know if if it's going to last. You know, I don't yeah. know if it's going to outlive me. And so all of these things, you have to rethink everything, and then you have to get your will organised. You have to make sure the finances are done right for your family. That you've already done power of attorney. It's just so much paperwork. But at the same time, find that time to live for the moment. Yeah. Surely. I don't do live for the moment. No? I, I, no, because I just feel as though it's too much pressure. Yeah. As people are like, you need to live every day like it's your last. That is crap. Yeah. Because you're lying in bed listening to a podcast and you're thinking, I should be up a mountain. Yeah, I have too no, much. No, I don't want to go up a there's mountain. There's no bucket list. Then. No, I don't want a bucket list. No, no. I just want to keep going and until I die. Yes. Yeah. all I want to do. There's a... Is, is there, I, I, I say this from my own experience of having, having supported my mum through mm -hmm. chemotherapy, and I remember taking her to one session, mm. and we started laughing in, in that group. Something yeah. funny happened in that space, yeah. right? That, and I think it was somebody sat on the chair and it made a funny noise yeah, when they sat yeah. down, and we laughed. But there was a guilt factor about mm. laughter. There. I don't know. I go in on my own, and I, I go into a side room. I yeah. don't want to sit in the, the no, 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 room. No, no, no. No, because I cry a lot and I yeah. don't want people seeing me crying all the time. Um, and if they've got a side room, I'll take that and I'll do chemo on my own where they have got a big shared room at the beach. Yeah, yeah. But I, and it's not because, you know, any other reason other than 
I just want a bit of privacy. Occasionally, when I've been in the hospital, I sometimes put my, my face mask and my hood on, yeah. and people will come over and lift up my hood and go, Hiya! Oh, right gosh. into my face, and I'm like, Nah, not the time. Yeah. So I kind of just yeah, hide yeah. in a room myself so yeah. I can cry on my own, and nobody can see me getting upset when I get the cannula in. Because I don't want to upset other people as well. No. But you made a very conscious decision to be open ab- about your aye, cancer. Aye, I mean, I'll you? do everything that yeah, way. Yeah, but yeah. if you're going to just sit and stare at me when I get a needle put in my no. hand, then no. No. I just want to do that privately. Occasionally, I've had to go into the big ward, and that's cool. I just put a, a hat yeah, on yeah. and an eye mask on, and I just sit quiet. Yeah. And I try not to draw too much attention to myself. And because people expect me to be funny and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've said, like, why don't you tell us a joke? I'm like, I'm getting a cannula put in for cancer. It's, it's not really the time. No, 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 can, no. Can we not do this no, now? No, no, no. Absolutely. Like, can we have a picture? Not now. No. Not just now. No. So. <laughs> but your life has been incredible. I, uh, you've, you've used things to make you stronger along the way. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I suppose so. I've laughed at my mother's murder. I laughed at getting caught with guns in the house and yeah the the darkest material is funny when I first got the cancer one of my best friends called me up and said what size is your shoes and I couldn't stop laughing really yeah because I knew she wanted my shoes oh really yeah it's brilliant that's extraordinary no but that's great but that's it what 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 doesn't kill you makes you stronger yeah yeah, yeah my pals not laughed they're like you should get a new sofa and curtains and then when you die I can get them that's... they're encouraging me to buy stuff they know do you think that do you think that or is that because people say awkward things as I'm well around sneeze. death and illness I'm tissue darling sorry <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I've no, got no, the sniffles. Um, no, my <laughs> pals make an awful lot of comedy out of it, and they say things like, oh, you should really buy that beautiful bracelet and then leave it to me in your will. You yes. know, they have a good laugh about it. Yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. But that's been, that's been consistent, and that is part of your legacy, isn't yeah. it? How you've, 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 not, you've not feared to go places I don't with your think... comedy. No, and I don't think there is. People say to me, where is the line you cross in comedy? Where is the line you draw? And I draw the line at sending people to Rwanda. That's yes. where I draw the line. I'm going to blow my nose, everybody. Please excuse me. Oh, money. The drawbacks are came yeah, off. Yes. That's a really dry, weird nose. Um, I think there is a line. People always say, where, where, where do comedians draw the line? And I don't mean you said that. No. But people do say it. But they never ask it of politicians. And they never say to politicians, where do you draw the line? No. And they will tax and dehumanise the chronically ill and they'll send people to Rwanda and they'll joke about trans people. And, you know, they don't ask them where they draw the line. So no. don't ask us. No, we no, don't no, send no. people to Rwanda. So, no. But I am fearless in my comedy and I do say the most outrageous things. And it's not like I'm shouting them through your letterbox. You don't have to come no. and see me. That's right. That's right. And you don't have to listen. don't have to listen. And then people, it, it's really weird because the most easily offended people on the internet are the right wing. They're the people who have got mocked up memes of Nicola Sturgeon dressed as a Nazi or Hamza Yusuf dressed as the Al-Qaeda, but they are absolutely offended at any language you use in comedy. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, that's a wee bit hypocritical. Yes, just a little bit. Just yeah, a little yeah, bit. it's the right wing who are the snowflakes. They're the people who yeah. are most offended. They're the people who are absolutely hell-bent on cancel culture. Yeah, yeah. But actually, politics provides complete and utter fodder absolutely at the same time yeah no unbelievably i get the scottish tories spent a long time the mps and their followers writing to every theater to get me cancelled they never said a word about michelle moan she's on the run and i've sold out yeah yeah so up them and how could you be cancelled when you're in a pantomime i know (laughs) Um, i know it's very weird how people draw the line on what they're offended at. People will go back 20, 30 years to find something that you said to be offended at. And it's not in the public domain, so they have to hunt for it. It's like looking for a bit of dog poo in a garden and picking it up and saying to people, smell that, sure, it's bad. Folk are like, yeah, where did you get that? 30 years ago, I found it in a bush. Yes. Like, well, put it away. Nobody needs yes. to smell it. Absolutely. It's not like it's, it's, it's on the telly or in, just go away. But no, they, and, and they're usually right-wing people that do that. 
I'm, I'm fascinated every time I talk to comedians because I, I, there's a Victoria Wood quote that I really love, which is comedians fall into two camps. Mm. They're either deeply melancholic mm -hmm. or they just like golf. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't fall into either of those camps. I'm not a fan of golf and I'm not melancholic. You know, they say a lot of comedians are, you know, mentally unwell or they're very sad or they're the sad clown that gets them. I don't think that's true of a lot of comics. I, I'm just good at telling stories that are funny. Yeah. And I think I would have still did that if I hadn't been abused and had yeah. murdered. And all. I'd still think, because I am very optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm an optimist. I'm not one of those that... I never really had any mental illness problems until I got cancer. And then apparently I've got a mental illness. I didn't know I had one, but apparently I have anxiety. I'm like, yeah, well... People say things like, oh, you know, I could get hit with a bus tomorrow, you know, and I'm like, well, th the difference is, is I've got a bus chasing me. Yes. You know? Yes. And I, I don't really have anxiety. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not anxious about dying. No. I'm anxious about what it's going to do to my husband and my daughter. Yeah. How they're going to cope, you know, I'm more worried about that. And it's really weird because being away for three weeks, they're really traumatized just now and I had to say to my husband what's going on he went I think that we've just realized what the house looks like without you in it that's extraordinary so yeah. they've just that's just dawned on them yes because I spoke to him today and I said why are you being odd and why is Ashley so not want to speak on the phone to me and he went it's because I think we've just realized what what this space looks like when you're not here and it's yeah. brought it home to them yeah i'm like yeah but i'm coming home tomorrow They're like, yeah i know but they both have autism so they've got a different view so i think that they're both living in a twilight rehearsal yes of what it'll be like when i die yeah the yeah, yeah. dog is running about looking for me wow. constantly wow and that's upsetting ashley because the dog's crying all yeah. the time looking for me and she's yeah. like when you die, we're going to have to bury Greyfriars Bobby, will you? Because we can't kind of suffer that noise. <laughs> <laughs> honey's running to be going, where's my mummy? I want my mama. And, and Ashley's like, oh. And meanwhile, you're you're travelling around the country making lots of other people laugh. Yes. Is, is, there a, is there a dynamic there that yeah, perhaps I, you should be at? I they think, want you home. Yeah, they, no, they do want me home, but they've always been really good at me being away. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's never been a thing where you're place belongs at home like a lady with a very good underskirt well we've never had that <laughs> very good underskirt yeah, yeah but we've never had that it's just that he's he said i think ashley just sees this as a rehearsal that you not being in this space and it's just me and you for three weeks now and they and the dog going where is the woman that feeds me <laughs> so she's traumatized because they two are very good with the dog diet i'm like i can't feed you enough no. So she's like, I'm starving. Where's the cancer woman with the sausages? So. On the subject of rehearsal, Jamie, you've got your show coming up. We're gonna have to gonna have to let you go shortly to do oh, that. But thank you for having me. Thank you for I mean, is there any us. questions you would like to ask me? Something that a lot of people, you know, never ask me. Is there something that you've wanted to ask? I I are you ready? Am I ready to go? Yes. That's a really good question. Am I ready to die? That's a brilliant question. I think that I am. I think that I've done all the things I need to do. Yes. I've wrote the book. I've done the film. I've got a film coming out. I've got a tour yes. of the film coming out. I've lived a lot. I think I am ready. I think that there's nothing that I haven't done. Um, no, I, you know, the, the only thing I haven't done is I've not mastered the violin and I've never <laughs> driven. I bought a mask. Never driven. A, I've no, I don't drive. I just bought a I car. I think you dodged drive. a bullet there, to be fair. I know. Oh, fuck, I've been hit with a car twice. I, just, yeah. I, I get hit by a car going for the, my, my brownie's road safety badge, so <laughs> it's really best I don't drive. It's true. I get hit by a car going, that I'm would... going for my road safety badge. <laughs> wow. No. Lying in the road with a big broken leg. But I think that uh, mentally I am prepared. I've kind of went through... Uh, Nobody's ever asked. I'm really glad you've asked this. I've kind of went through a mental um, sort of checklist yeah. that at least I know that I'm going to have a chemically induced death. You are. I'm not going to die in pain. No. 
unless I do get hit with a bus. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be in a hospital situation where they'll control it and they'll give me morphine, which I feel really weird about because I don't like drugs that make me feel woozy. No. I've never been a drug taker. I'm really glad I never did heroin and I kept my veins good. That's <laughs> always been a bonus as well. Um, so I'm kind of worried about getting full of, um, you know, these mind-altering drugs. Yeah. I'm kind of like... I, part of me is like, oh, yeah, hit me with all the morphine you can... But the other part's like, no, what if it's a really weird dream I'm having and I die having a weird dream? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want that. <laughs> don't want that. So I don't know if I want to this... die without getting morphined up or if I just want to go in my sleep. And I, I don't know. The reason I ask it is because I think, I think for some people, there is this kind of Victorian obsession yeah. Isn't there about eking things out yes. as long as you possibly can? Yeah. And you've always struck me as somebody that kind of, well, you defy quite a lot of things. Yeah. And that that's one of them, that actually you've been so open. And yeah, that actually... no, I think I'm ready. I don't think there's anything. I've done lots of holidays with my husband. I've spent great time with Ashley. I've been a good mommy and a bad mommy. Everybody always thinks they're a good mommy, but you, it doesn't matter. Like my own mother says, let me be an inspiration or a dire warning. And I think I've been both. Yeah. So <laughs> I kind of am looking forward to, there's a part of me, looking forward to the end because I don't want to live a long time with this uncertainty. Yes. This, so if I live in three month increments because yes. I get a scan every three months. Yes. So every three months I have this terrifying anxiety for what's going to happen. There's a part of me like, screw it, I can't wait to go because I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live like that forever. But I think for some people to hear you say that, that is so empowering. Yeah, because and I hope it does. Because the guilt factor for yeah. some people to, to, to voice that would be yeah. too huge. No, you're right. A lot of people are scared to talk about that and, you know, because they feel they're letting their family down. I can't babysit everybody else's grief. No. I can't do it. When I go, I need to go. And I don't want it to be... I don't want to live, unless, unless I can live like this where I'm fairly physically okay, but if it's going to be a really difficult, more treatment, I'll always be in treatment till I die. Yes. I'll always, because it's incurable. Yeah. But if it's going to have to be really radical, painful treatment just to keep eking it out, then no, let me go when I'm good and ready. And I think I'm ready. And there is a part of me really looking forward to it where I can go, Fuck, I'm done, you know. I don't want any more needles. I don't want any more chemicals. I don't want any more. That, I haven't reached that point just now. No. But I know that when I do, it'll be a conscious decision that I can make and say to everybody else, that's it, I'm done. That's so strong, Janie, and, and inspirational. Really? Oh, thank you. I... But I think it's, it's... I'm glad you asked me that. Nobody... People are scared to ask in that question. But, yeah, I think I'm, I'm ready to go when that time is right. And um and I'm I, there's days when I'm looking forward to it like, oh, I'm done with all this. <laughs> Do you know like when you're trying to you wait a queue and somebody gets in your road, I'm like, oh. I I haven't time for this. <laughs> time for me to go. <laughs> Jane Godley, you are an inspiration. You are a legend, and it has been absolutely my privilege to talk to you. Thank you, darling. Have a great show. This Thank evening. you. Thank you. I'm going to wait to see if I can annoy somebody else. <laughs>
going to need considerably bigger buns. You're listening to Norwich Theatre Talks. I'm Stephen Crocker. I'm Chief Executive and Creative Director of Norwich Theatre. And that was quite an extraordinary conversation with actress, comedian and writer Janie Godley. Now, my second guest is draw- always drawn from within the Norwich Theatre team. And I'm delighted to welcome to Norwich Theatre Talks, Theresa Baker, our Head of People and Culture. Theresa Baker, welcome to Norwich Theatre Talks. Now, you are our Head of People and Culture, and for people that don't exist in this weird world that we do, just say a little bit about what that means. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me along. It's interesting to be here. Um, So People and Culture is um, probably what used to be known as HR um, quite some time back. So it's looking really at the people that work in the organisation, but also how that links to the wider um, culture. And we've a lot of people here. We do. People might un- yeah. <laughs> underestimate quite how many bodies it takes. Yes, yeah. I mean, we have about 250 staff, just slightly under, um, and about another 170 volunteers, um, and then probably about 40-odd freelancers that work with us. So we're quite a large um, group of people. And a very, very diverse and disparate and different group of folk as well all all existing under one roof yeah that, absolutely because to be to make it work you've got both the creative side you've obviously got the technical side you've got the hospitality you've got the finance you've got all of those marketing there's so many different areas um all of which bring together to make the, the whole place work yeah and i think i think i guess some people's view of hr uh, which is a sort of term that still exists it does, it's, absolutely, yeah. it's a term we've chosen not to use yeah. here because we we want to see more about the, the people that we work with and we work alongside and the culture within which we work but i suppose people see that as kind of hiring and firing but it's right ra- it's rather a lot more it, it is yeah i mean it's it it covers everything from sort of how you would how and who you attract to the organization to the experience that they have bringing them in how you're looking after people when they work here their well-being um as they go through their life stages because you have people who join they might be le- still learning something they might qualify they might become parents that they might become ill so you've got all of those different things through somebody's career um all the way to mo- somebody moving on which might be career development or retirement or any any other reason so it's all of those little bits in between and you enjoy being in this world of people because for some people (laughs) some people that might just be utterly terrifying i'd much rather work with a machine but you're working with a glorious technicolor of individuals does that is that something you thrive on i do I i really like knowing and understanding what makes people tick um and certainly in this organization it's been brilliant because you see the passion that people have from creating something even from panto which i had no idea before i joined here the the level of detail that goes into that starting from now all the way to to december and the amount of people that are involved so getting that sort of diversity of the people that i'm having contact with and their life experiences and how that lived experience shapes how they are in the workplace and how we can then support that is just fascinating because we do, we do bring our whole selves to work, don't we? Yes. And that can be both a good and a bad thing, I guess. It can. I mean, that is the thing, is everybody has good and there's good and bad times. There are things that people go through which shape how they behave at work. Sometimes that can be more challenging and people need a bit more support at different times. So it's, it's not just thinking people need to come in and be, perform to high standards all the time we need to uh, accept that people have things going on in lives and have different lived experiences and that can impact Mm -hmm. and I think that deep understanding of that helps to to make sure that everything runs quite smoothly and what was your route to come to do this role how did you come to be a a people professional well that is quite long I mean my first ever job was as a trainee jeweler making (laughs) jewellery um and um then I become a travel agent (laughs) for a bit um I actually then worked in a hospital um in an admin role then an A&E reception Wow. sort of try it triaging into that yeah. um before very people focused it was very people focused and that you again you see diversities of people people coming into you in very challenging circumstances yeah, yeah. um my ex-husband was in the RAF so that's why I moved 
jobs a little bit um, and then went into sort of pensions, which was starting to become HR. Um, but I mean, ultimately, it was a bit of an accident, which a lot of people do find. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It was it was um, a job I was doing. There was a bit of a competition between a finance director and a HR director. And they said, did you want to do the qualification? Because there was a bit of this. They were going to put one of their member of staff, and I thought, yep, and that was how I got into it and just really enjoyed it. Amazing. I mean, so people have kind of led to people. Yes, uh, yeah. Along the way. Yeah, I mean, that was, what, well, 30 years ago, sort of in moving yeah. into that role. But, yeah, it's quite a lot of different roles to get to that point. And has have things must have changed as an HR professional over that period of time, the kind of challenges that businesses mm. face in employing people and and keeping a healthy workforce, the kind of challenges that employees have coming to work, that, that must have changed quite a lot over that period of time. It has. I mean, I think certainly when my first job in, in HR was personnel officer, which was probably quite admin-y. Yes. Um, and there wasn't a lot of focus on sort of well-being and actually getting the best out of people. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, is been something that's really developed of actually you can develop people through their career um, and how you support them through that that's been quite a major change it was yeah. very much admin focused at the start with yeah and I think as employers we've become much more aware of those people that we do employ and actually for, for, for certain organizations like like our own mm. we talk a lot about inclusion don't mm. we and trying to make sure that we represent the broadest range of people mm. and can relate to the broadest range of people through through our staff base yeah. that that's something that's grown as an agenda in the workplace over over the past 15 years hasn't it, it has and and rightly so i think as if, if i think um, there's been a lot of research done that organisations will be most successful if they've got diversity of views yes. um, and be more, more creative and productive if you've got lots of differing views looking at how you do things and how you make things better. If you've just got one set of people giving thoughts and feelings, you, you're going to get that one set of views. Yes. Um, and I think that research has then led to organisations realising that if they actually support people and um, help them to bring their whole selves to work and have that creativity then that really helps um, in product productivity and and over your career you'll have seen huge changes I, I'm hoping in terms of gender representation yes. within the workforce within change of legislation to make workplaces mm. fairer and more inclusive and less prejudicial places yes. to be I'm guessing Yes, I mean, I mean, I know when I, I've sort of given you the route that I came into um, HR, but when I was at school, I wanted to be an electrical engineer. Right. But that was the 80s, and when I spoke to the careers advisor, they said, you're a girl, could you go and learn to type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I have a similar story. I grew up in South Wales, and I was told I should be a quarry manager. Yes. <laughs> the quarrying industry lost out, I can tell you. Yeah, and I think that, and also that sort of, um, sort of social... Um, inclusion as well is it's not just around sort of various protected characteristics but it's around people's backgrounds yeah. um, and that is something that's really I think changed um, and those yeah those attitudes have now changed so that people are encouraged to follow a career that they um, that fits them rather than what people feel that they should fit into a particular group yeah. and that, that that work is never done no. is it <laughs> I mean there are still there is still a lot to do. What 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 are the kind of key areas that you see in, within within HR spheres where we just need to 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 keep on on with this? I think the big thing is around having conversations, um, and that is something because it it feels uncomfortable if people are hearing some, about somebody's lived experience that is quite different to them. That can feel really uncomfortable. Um, but that is so, but only by having those conversations are you going to get to understand people's lived experiences. I mean, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged woman. Menopause is a key thing, and through Davina Hall talking about it, and there's a lot more talking um, about it, which has helped bring that to the fore, and that's only by having those conversations about people's various lived experiences are we going to be able to do that and that's something that, that that's something you've particularly championed isn't mm. it within Norwich Theatre's life Menopause Cafe yep. has Menopause. been a really successful has, part yep. of our our well-being work yep. would, would you say a little bit more about how the, the focus that you and your team give to to work around well-being 
Yeah, I mean, well-being is, because I say, it does very much depend on people's backgrounds. We've got um, all t people with different, um, say, lived experiences. And um, looking and talking to people, menopause was a particular one that came up, so that we thought we'll just have a cafe. Trialled at first, we had quite a few people. I think we had about six or seven to the first one. Um, and those conversations people found really helpful. Um, and also um, then sort of having a look where sort of we worked with various organisations to sort of find, get information in, to do training. We've done some LGBTQ plus training with um, staff. We've done autism awareness. Um, we've had um, sort of deaf awareness training. And it's just really helping to open people's eyes and understand those different experiences. And I think when people are bringing, which, which I, I feel so passionately about, mm. as you know, their whole selves to work, that, 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 change, that, that changes the responsibility of a manager, mm. doesn't it? And I mean, we, we've talked a lot about, uh, and, and, and it, it's no secret that we are living through a mental health crisis in mm. this country at the moment. Mm. And that, that, that brings a different responsibility as an employer, doesn't it? It does. And, I mean, it is hard. I mean, manage, managing people is, is hard. Mm. And it's particularly difficult in, I think, perhaps smaller organisations such as us, where you've got people who are technical specialists as well as people managers. Yes. Larger organisations have the luxury of being able to have somebody who's a people manager, and that's they can be very highly trained in that. We have people who have to juggle, and that's a real challenge. Um, and you have to adapt your style to the different people in your team because somebody might need a lot of reassurance somebody else might not and it's that's actually quite a hard hard role to do yeah so how, how would you how would you kind of typify the role of the role of hr is it is it a combination of being kind of watchdog being parent <laughs> being agony aunt what, what how how would you when, when it's working well how how, how's that interjection into an organisation? I think when it's working well, it's I would see that we're a sort of a trusted partner to yeah. support managers with managing their people. So we can be a sounding board. We can be, give advice and guidance. We can um, talk about various options. I, I don't see us as a, as a police, but we do need to sort of make sure that there's consistency so yeah. that people aren't having different experiences across the organisation um, but I think it's I see it a bit like if you go to the, the doctor you you don't go in and say I want some penicillin you go because they will say what are your yeah, symptoms yeah, yeah. and yeah. that would be the same yeah. so sometimes people come yeah, to us and I think this needs to happen and we'll ask what the symptoms are and what and then give options yeah. I've often I've often watched it and it's the reason I'm, I mentioned the parent thing because I know you're very very good at not managing for the manager yes but actually being a sounding board but it must be really hard when you see somebody and go no don't do that don't do it that. can but i mean i will always i mean we, i would normally say to a manager if if you want to practice something practice yes. on me yeah 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 okay tell me off <laughs> come and tell me off tell me off for, for, for doing something i shouldn't yeah. and practice that wording because yeah, yeah. that can just help them go through that and i can i can be awkward but it's a safe environment Absolutely. and it's giving managers that psychological safety to practice yeah 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 and how is it? Um, you, you've worked across a lot of industries in, in your career. Yep. Um, ha, ha, this was your first role in, in the creative mm. sector, I think. Yes. Ha, how different is it working, working in this kind of environment? Um, I think the main difference, um, I think, because it's, you've got that mix of people who are highly creative and that also the people who are doing probably more administrative, yes. um, professional roles. Yes. Um, and there's quite a big difference. So creative people tend to be quite hard on themselves, I find. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a friend of mine who does amateur dramatics and I've been to mm -hmm. see her shows. And at the end of it, the audience are loving it. And we're like, oh, that was brilliant. <laughs> and the first thing they're all saying to each other, oh, I stood in the wrong place. I did this wrong. I said that wrong. And they're yeah. very critical. And I find that so hard because I think you've just given people such joy. <laughs> yeah. And I'd love to be able to help creative people see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's the main difference. I find it, yeah, just understand you've given some people some real joy here. But also that there's something about, isn't there, the mix of individuals that we could mm. have working in our buildings at any yeah. one time. I, I find that every day when you sort of walk through the backstage corridors and you have all these performers that are visiting us yeah. and they're, they're kind of part of our people for that short period of time. Yeah. You know, they're coming into 
this kind of coming into our house almost, aren't they? And they that, you know, are. it's for all of us to uphold our, our values in how we interact. It is, and I think that's really important, is that people, when they come to us, um, whether it's as a repeat, sort of as a performer coming back or just for the first time, that they get that really good experience that sort of demonstrates our values and they, they go away feeling really positive about it. So, Teresa, thank you so much for talking to us. Let, let's conclude by, tell me some of the things you're looking forward to that are coming up. Um, are coming up, um, I think it's really, um, the last few years we've, I mean, let's, I say this sounds really boring, I am looking forward to a new HR system. My <laughs> colleagues will certainly know that we are looking forward to changing um, that. Um, but I think certainly this year, I mean, I think the work that... Um, some of my colleagues in creative engagement are going to be doing around kindness. Um, that is, I'm really looking forward to that because I think that leads lives with our values and that can really help feed into our people processes as well. So actually how we embed that. Um, we've also had a sort of staff survey fairly recently, getting some real actions out of that. Um, so they're the real sort of things that sort of excite me. Um, going forward. Fantastic. Well, that's a lovely note to end on. Our next Creative Matters season, which will launch later in the year, will focus on creativity in kindness. Theresa, thank you very much for joining me on Norwich Theatre Talk and for being part of and helping support the amazing Norwich Theatre team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for quite an extraordinary episode of Norwich Theatre Talks with such honesty and a moving account of her current experiences from Janie Godley. My huge thanks to Janie and also to Teresa Baker for joining me. We'll see you again next time. If you've been affected by any of the themes we've talked about in the podcast today, coming up on the screen are some websites where you can find further resources and support.